a wonderful time of worship. I get the opportunity to introduce you guys to our guests today. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor to be able to do that. This is uh, Revel, whose name is actually Alejandro Ruiz. Uh, make sure I pronounce that correctly. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, Alejandro Revel uh, drove up uh, yesterday with uh, his wife, Tiana, and their son, Noah, who I believe is over in the children's building, but it's great to have you with us uh, today as well. They're from Florida, and I got to hear um, from Revel about 10 years ago, uh, he gave his life to Christ. And at that point, uh, I believe you were an engineer, right? Uh, so fits in great here, right? Plenty of engineers in the room. Uh, but God called him to use his gifts and his talents to share the gospel through art, and he has performed, God has used him in a lot of different venues and stadiums uh, and Major League Baseball events, NFL uh, games, uh, college events, and he is here today to show you how God is using him and the gifts and abilities, the talents that he's given him to share the gospel in a very unique way. So would y'all join me in welcoming Revel?
Thank you. <laughs> How's it going, guys? Good morning. You guys doing okay? Woo. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you guys. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Roger, for uh, inviting me to come share. Um, you know, when I got here, I felt just the love of God so, so tangible when I was greeted. I go to a lot of churches, and sometimes you kind of get lost in the weeds. You don't know where to go. But even before I got here in the parking lot, the greeters here, shout out the greeters. They're so filled with the love of God. They're the first persons that we see when we walk into the church. They're the hands and feet, and I felt that when we, we came in, me and my wife. And uh, I'm a little bit out of breath, so <laughs> as you can tell, it's been a, it's been an honor to be here. So I'm from Florida. It's a little... A little colder than I expected. I'm a Florida boy. I'm a little wimp when it comes to cold weather. And my wife, she's from Columbia, so I can't imagine. It's probably worse for her. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. Did you guys enjoy the painting? Yes. Thank you. So yeah, I, the reason I paint upside down, long story short, I'm going to share real briefly how I got started painting, why I paint. Um, it's, my life was upside down. I, I was trying to paint a masterpiece from what I thought was right. I was trying to do what felt right to a man. I was trying to do things to fill in the emptiness that I had inside. And I was, you know, I was happy on the outside. Everything looked great. Great career. Everything I ever wanted. Um, you know, engineers in the house. It's a great career. Promising. I had my own office. Um, uh, I was working with a, a company based out of Seattle, working from Orlando. Um, and around the same time, um, just going through a lot of stuff, in, in interior stuff that I hadn't dealt with since I was little. Uh, I never grew up in church. Uh, I never had a reason to, to go to church, actually. Um, both of my parents aren't necessarily Christian. My mom. We went to church a couple times uh, when we were little, but I never had um, kind of a Christian household background. So my father's an atheist. He's, um, he's, he will, he'll, he'll be saved, though. Amen? Come on. Who here doesn't have any, uh, has unsaved uh, family members in the house? He's faithful. Your family shall be saved, and he's not a man that should lie. And the reason I'm here today is because my mother, she would pray with me when I was little. And she spoke something into my life, a seed that was planted, and it sprouted into something later in life. It took a long time, but I'm here today because of those prayers, because of that foundation from a little child, even though I didn't grow up in, that, in a Christian household, like I said. But um, when I was about 25, like I said, I had a great career, great, great job. I um, was about to go to art school, but I did not go to art school because I was afraid, and my parents told me that I was crazy. I was like, hey, mom, I want to be an artist. You want to do what? Uh, Spanish parents, when you tell them that, they'll either throw a sandal at your head or tell you to get out of the house, go be a lawyer, go be a doctor, go do something with your life. What do you mean you're going to be an artist? So I didn't do that because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know my identity in Christ. So I became a software engineer. Um, and then somebody invited me to go to church for the first time. It was a roommate from college. And at first I was like, no, I'm good. That's not really for me. Um, but I was dealing with a lot of depression, loneliness, and anxiety at the time. Everything looked great on the outside, like I said, but on the inside, I was empty. And there was only one thing that could f fulfill that emptiness, and I was about to meet him. I went to this church, and the pastor was talking about how it's not about religion. Religion says you have to do X, Y, and Z to get to God, but Jesus did away with that, and all he wants is a relationship. He took upon himself sin. He became sin so that we could become the righteous of God. And I had never heard the gospel before, my first time hearing it like that. And I was like, wow, who is this Jesus? Like, I guess I, I want to know him. Like, so I raised my hand, and then they did an altar call, and when I came up to the front, uh, I just remember feeling the presence of God for the first time in my life. And I just started crying and weeping, um, and they prayed for me. And that moment changed my life forever. And I had to tell people about Jesus. So I was like, so what do I do now? God, you're real. How do I tell you, how, how do I share you with people? I don't have any, uh, any agenda to become an artist or any vision to be, be, be painting in front of people or anything like that. 
I just wanted to share God. I just wanted to share what he did. In my, he took away my depression, my anxiety. He flipped my life upside down and showed me the true purpose that he had for me, the true masterpiece that he had for me all along. And I was dropped my paintbrush in that moment, and I said, God, use me. Here I am, Lord. Use me. I don't know. I'm, not, I'm a nobody. I, I, I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best. I don't know how to c- communicate this. What do I do? And I just remember in my office that week, I would just started painting. I just started sketching. I just had to release it somehow. Like, what, how do I share Jesus? So I just started doing little sketches, and I would post it on Instagram. And, and somebody from my church, I started going to church, and then she was like, oh, wow. Like, I didn't know you could paint. That's amazing. Why don't you come and paint during uh, the worship service? And I was like, paint what? Like, what are you talking about? And she was like, oh, come paint, uh, you know, something during the, the service. And I was like, you mean like an hour? How long do I have? She was like, oh, no, five minutes. I'm like, sure, I'll pray about it. So um, after about a couple of days, I kept, I kept thinking about what she said because I wanted to be obedient. But at the same time, I was like, I can't do anything in five. That's crazy. I'll do a stick figure or something like that. Uh, and then God started speaking to me, you know, in Abraham. He, I didn't call Abraham to a comfortable place. Because I can't use him there. I had to take him outside of what he knew to a new land where I was able to bless him and his generations. I want to take you to a new place that it's not in your own strength that you're going to be able to do it. Because I can't use you there. I can only use you when you step out of your comfort zone. Uh, I can only use you when you step out of what you know. Out of where you're familiar with to a new place. Because then there you can only rely on me for strength. There only you can trust in me. There... I can use you as a vessel. I'm the potter, you are the clay. And I was like, well, okay, well, what do I do then, Lord? So I went on Google, typed in live art fast. And the first thing that came up was this guy on this big stage with paints and lights and stuff like that. And he was throwing paint on the canvas. And after like, I think like four or five minutes, he flipped it upside down. The whole time I'm looking at this guy like, he's crazy. What is he doing? It makes no sense. What's the big deal? What's the big deal about? And then he flipped upside down, and it was Michael Jackson. And I was like, that's it. I got to paint Michael Jackson. And I'm just <laughs> uh, right there, I was like, that's it. Because my, my life didn't make any sense at all. But when he showed me who he was and how loving he is and his purpose for my life, my purpose in him, it all kind of turned it around. All my sin, all my shame, all my guilt, all the things. I was in the world. I was, I was a rebel, literally. Like, and now I'm a rebel, but I was a rebel. And, and he took that, and the things I've done, and he took that, and he, he flipped upside down and showed me, no, son, I paid a price for you, a high price for you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. I have a purpose for your life. Before the foundations of the earth, I knew you. He, knew, he knows you. He knew your name before your mother even thought about your name. He, he, he already had a plan for your life that's greater than you, than you can ever want for yourself. He wants more for you than you can want for yourself. I had no desires of doing this or painting in front of stadiums or anything like that. I don't like being center of attention. Totally out of my comfort zone. Um, but now he's giving me the desires of my heart. He gives you the desires of your heart, things that you don't even know about you. But he's calling you to step out, step out of what's comfortable. So I, that's what I did. I took that step of faith, and I went to Home Depot. <laughs> and I was like, hey, where can I get a canvas uh, like this big and all that? And the guy's looking at me like I'm crazy, like, what canvas? Uh, we have boxes, cardboard. And I was like, oh, this guy's a jerk. I'm out of here. He's being sarcastic. And as a light bulb went off, oh, I could paint on, can- on the cardboard. I can stack them, paint it black and then go on there and paint on the black canvas, which is actually cardboard. And that's what I did. My first painting was Jesus, and I was like, please come out like Jesus. I was shaking, I was nervous, painting to the music, and I flipped it upside down. And right there and then, God started opening doors. It was like immediately I became, started painting. I would go to the dark places as well. Um, It's not for everybody, but I would go to places where people were either open mics like downtown, like, well, have you guys ever do open mics around here where it's like at a club or something and spoken word or they have musical talents that come out, anybody can sign up. So I would sign up 
and I would bring my boxes. People thought I was homeless. Show up and then give, it, give the DJ the little Hillsong CD, and he'd be like, Hillsong, what's that about? And I'm like, just put it in. That's my, my track, you know? And the DJ would put on worship music in the middle of the club, and people were like, what's going on? What's happening? And then I flip it upside down, and the atmosphere, I, you can see the atmosphere change. I can see it. The presence of God would come in, and I would always run into pastor's kids. I was I'll always run into people that were running from God, but you cannot run the love of Jesus. Amen? You cannot outrun the, run of Jesus, the, outrun the love of Jesus. You cannot. Peter said, Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Then feed my lambs. He wanted to know the intention of Peter's heart. Where was his heart? What was his, what was his intention? The two greatest commands is love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest commandments that Jesus said. Because you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. And you can't love yourself until you know who you are in Christ. And when you know that, you'll, you'll love him with all your mind and your strength. When you know the, the price that he paid for you and how much he loves you. All the things that you've gone through. All the difficulties. All the, all the shame and the guilt. He wants to wash it clean, and he wants to use your hands and feet. You are the salt of the earth. You are a city upon a hill that cannot be hidden. Those were the words that were burning in my heart. So I would go, and I would share the gospel to all these dark places, and that's how God started opening doors through that. He wants to use your gifts, your talents. All I had was a, was a pencil and a paper. That's all I had. Um, but he's just looking for someone who's saying, here I am, Lord, use me. Here are my hands, Lord, use me. Here are my feet, Lord. Use me. What's my gift? What can I do to serve you? How can I give you glory? How can I show people you? You are creator. All creativity comes from you, Lord. Show me how to create, how to glorify you. You'll see what he can do with that, with, the, with a, a rock that, to take down Goliath. Whatever you have in your hand, what's your, what's your tool? Draw bone of a donkey to defeat a thousand Philistines. What's your tool? What's your tool? Mustard seed. What's your, what, is, what does he put on your hand? The faith, faith is what moves the heart of God. And it doesn't, it's not easy stepping out of the comfort zone, trying something different, trying something new. But I promise you, he will use you to do amazing things for his glory. Who here wants to be used in a new way, a different way today? Who here wants to be used differently by God in a way that you never thought he could use you? I want to pray for you real quick. Is that okay? Lord, I, I thank you for every person in this room, Lord. I thank you for their hearts. I love you so much, Lord, for their lives, Lord. Thank you for, for your love, God, and your grace, Lord, and your mercy for us, Lord. Thank you for the cross. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about what you did on the cross, Lord. Help us to love you. Help us to surrender and pick up our cross, Lord, every day, Lord, and to let go of the distractions of this world, Lord, to what seems right to a man. Help us to focus in on you this year, Lord. Help us to hear your voice, Jesus. Help us to hear your voice, Lord. Lord, I pray for everyone here to be used by you in a new and creative way. Those, those gifts that have been stored up, Lord, on the shelf. I see, I see things that have been stored on a shelf, Lord. I thank you right now that you're reminding that person right now about those gifts that they've had stored for a long time, Father, and that you would remind them, Father, and that you would stir up that, that gifting inside of them to be used by you in a new and creative way, Lord, to be a light in the darkness, Lord, in a, in a world that's, that needs you more than ever, Father. We thank you for revival in our lives, revival in our families, Lord. Holy Spirit, we give you permission, Lord, to use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm going to ask you guys just to give me a few minutes uh, to share with you. Um, you know, it's hard to, to build on that, but um, 
What you've heard today and seen illustrated today is a message of hope. And, and I just have to believe that there is somebody here in this room today that needs to hear this phrase. There is hope. No matter what you're going through in life, as good or as bad as it is, whatever it is that you are dealing with in your life, there is hope beyond what you're dealing with. You know, there's, have you ever heard anybody say, tell me in 25 words or less? Have you ever heard some version of that, right? Uh, what, what are they trying to say? Keep it brief. Get to the point, right? Well, I want to share with you a 25-word phrase that is a simple, direct, to-the-point message of hope. And that is the verse, John 3, 16. It's one that you've probably heard. Some know it, some don't. Uh, most know it, or have at least heard it before. And I want you to just read this verse with me. You can follow along, read it silently. You can say it out loud if you want to, but I'm going to read it. You follow it with me. A message of hope. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. A 25-word message of hope. And the amazing thing about this verse that we probably have heard, that most of us have memorized, that is well known uh, really throughout the, word, the, the world, the amazing thing about this verse is that it all began with a conversation. Possibly the most famous, I would argue, the most famous sermon that Jesus ever preached. This verse is in the heart of it. And the amazing thing about that sermon is, not, is that Jesus didn't invite a million people. He could have. He didn't invite a million people to hear that sermon. This sermon was given to one person, Nicodemus. And that tells us that, yes, God loves the whole world, as the verse says, but that also tells us that God loves you personally on a personal level as an individual created by him. And in this conversation, it begins with Nicodemus coming, a well-known religious leader coming to see Jesus. He, he meets with Jesus in secret. Uh, no one could know he was there. He comes in. Jesus invites him to sit down. And as they begin their conversation, verse 2 of that same passage says this, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, that beginning of the conversation we can all identify with because Nicodemus, he knows the, the law, a religious expert. He knows uh, the word of God to this point, right? He, he has head knowledge, and that's where he starts. He starts with what he knows. And we can learn something about our condition. All of us, at some point in our lives, we can learn something about our condition from Nicodemus. And what I would like to do is just, we're going to watch together a depiction of this conversation and a clip from The Chosen. Let's watch this together. What else? What have you come here to show us? A kingdom. That is what our rulers are worried about. No, not that kind. Then what? A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. You mean like a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? <sighs> I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, may she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh... His flesh. 
And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That part of you, that, is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind. How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear its sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the spirit. The spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the spirit, you can recognize his effect. Mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause among the teachers of the law. Yes, and I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. More miracles? Yes. But even more than that. Do you remember when the children of Israel complained against God and against Moses in the wilderness of Paran? Yes. They wanted to return to Egypt and they cursed the manna that God sent them. And then? They were bitten by serpents. And they were dying. But? But God made a way for them to be healed. Moses lifted the bronze serpent in the desert, and people only needed to look at it. So will the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Our people are not dying from snake bites. They're dying from taxation and oppression. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. Then from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, for the next few moments, let's just break down that back and forth, okay? Nicodemus, we can all identify with Nicodemus. And one of the ways we can is because Nicodemus starts with what he knows, right? He begins with what he knows, but he ends up falling short. He knew the law. He was a religious leader. He had head knowledge, and he starts with that head knowledge but he ends up falling short. He talks to Jesus. He's heard of Jesus. He shares that with Jesus. And then Jesus responds. And maybe, maybe Nicodemus thought, hey, Jesus would say, hey, I've heard of you too. Because Nicodemus was well known. But instead, Jesus says this in verse 3. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this is the continental divide of Scripture. Okay, Nicodemus is on one side, and Jesus is on the other. And Jesus doesn't pull any punches about their differences. He, he says to Nicodemus what has to take place in order for him to be saved. And, and, and we need to understand, by the way, that this is where we all are without Christ. We are on one side, Jesus is on the other, and there is no way we can get to him on our own. There is no way we can, we can be reborn. There's no way that we can take care of our sin problem, and we have all fallen short of God's glory. We have all sinned, and so this is where Nicodemus is, Jesus on one side, Nicodemus on the other, and that is where we are. We, we can identify here, and Nicodemus does what any of us would have done. He says, born again, verse 4. How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? 
And we see him here depending on his knowledge. This is the mistake that he's making. He's depending on what he knows, and he thinks this is impossible, which literally it is impossible for him to be physically reborn. And he's, he's using head knowledge here. And listen, we would all probably, tell me if you agree with this, we would probably all appreciate some do-overs in life, Right? To be able to go back in time and avoid making a mistake or to, to fix something that we've done that, that caused problems. Uh, we would like to have the opportunity to do some things different, but we, don't, we can't travel in time. We can't do that. We don't have the ability on our own to, to go back and fix things. We cannot have a do-over in that sense. And this is what has Nicodemus stumped, but Jesus doesn't give up. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, Jesus says, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know this, but I imagine that the scene unfolded much like what you saw in the video. A gust of wind they probably felt at that point. And Jesus uses that wind to illustrate something for Nicodemus. He, God's power works like the wind in many ways. It's obvious that it's there, but... We can't always see what he's doing. He is always working. And the new birth is something that takes place and that has to come from God. You can't wish it. You can't earn it. You can't create it on your own. You can't do it on your own. It has to be done by God. And these thoughts are just foreign to Nicodemus. He doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. But there is that phrase... Born again. This is a different language. This is not works done by men. This is a work done by God. That phrase, born again. Think about that for a minute. You know, birth is by nature a passive act. A baby cannot navigate birth his or herself. The mother suffers childbirth, right? And the, you're, you're in need of a capable parent for a child to be born. And the same is true for us spiritually. We cannot recreate ourselves. We can't rebirth ourselves. It's something that has to be done by a capable parent. It's something that has to be done by God himself. That word again. I want to introduce two Greek words to you, okay? All right, the first is palin. And this word is, is, these two different words are different words for again. Uh, And we see that word in this passage, to be born again. Now, the word palin carries the idea of just a simple repetition of an act, just doing something over again. But then there's another word, anathen. And that word has the idea of redoing something, but here's the catch with this second word. And this is the word that Jesus uses when he tells Nicodemus this. It's something that's repeated, but it has to be repeated by the person who did it the first time. That's the idea. It is of God, of heaven. It carries the idea of something that is done over by the original creator, but it has to be done by the original creator, and it is of God. And that's the word that Jesus uses. Let me see if I can explain this a little bit different way. The difference between Palin and Anathan is the difference between Revel painting this painting and me trying to paint this painting, okay? Okay. Technically speaking, I could, if I had the skill, which I don't, you talked about drawing stick figures, I couldn't even do that and make it look good. But if, let's just, for the purpose of imagination, if I had the ability, technically I could recreate this, right? Technically. But what we're talking about here, in order for this to be true to our text, to what Jesus is saying, in order for this to truly be recreated the way Jesus is saying, 
Revel would have to come up and do this all over again. We're not going to ask you to do it all over again. Don't worry. But that, that's what Jesus is saying. It's not good enough. A cheap imitation is not going to cut it here. Okay? It would have to be done by the original creator. And that's what Jesus is saying. No, Nicodemus, you can't do this. Only your creator can do this. Only God can provide this rebirth. And what he's saying is that he who did it the first time has to do it again. Those two words, born, God exerts the effort. He's the one that does it. And again, God restores the beauty. Only God can do this. And this thought, as you could imagine and saw in the video, just completely cold cocks Nicodemus. He, he, he just cannot fathom this. How can this be? How does this happen? And Jesus le- answers this by leading him to the verse that we started with, John three sixteen, the hope diamond of the Bible. If you want a message of hope, here it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So Nicodemus starts with what he knows, and like all of us, if we stay there, we end up falling short. But Jesus starts with the love of God, for God so loved the world, and then he ends with eternal life. And with that message of hope, and that one brief yet profound verse Jesus starts with God, ends with life, and then guess what? He offers it to each one of us. Eternal life available to each one of us. The heart of the human problem, we can't do it on our own. The heart of that problem is a heart problem. The Bible tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and that means all of us, every one of us. And we can't fix that on our own. But God's treatment for that condition is prescribed in John 3.16. He loves, he loves each and every one of you dearly. He loves you so much that he gave. He gave his one and only son to die on the cross to pay the price for our sins. How do we receive this new birth? Forgiveness, we believe. And if we will believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then we can live and experience a life of meaning and purpose. As Revel described to you how fulfilling God's purpose for his life brought meaning and purpose and direction. You can experience that too. And then you can experience eternal life with him in heaven. If you believe in Jesus, you will live. He loves And because he loves, he gave. He gave his only son. And if we believe, then we can experience eternal life. God so loved the world. You know, you might expect God to be angry. He created human beings. Human beings chose to sin. You might expect God to be angry, vindictive. But no, God so loves the world, the verse tells us. Think about that. He loves you no matter who you are what you've done in your life, the mistakes that you've made, God loves you. You are valuable to him. He loves you so much that he gave his one and only son to die for your sins. And scripture equates Jesus with God. And so God sent himself to pay the price for our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his rules No. His restrictions? No. His commands? No, that's not what it says. Yes, God has commands and and rules and all that, but this verse, Jesus himself, God himself said, God loved the world so much that he gave his son. He gave Jesus. And Jesus is God. And scripture tells us that whoever, a universal word, whoever believes in him, You know, Jesus came to this world, Scripture tells us that he lived a sinless life, and then he died on the cross 
to pay the price for our sins. Only he could do that. Only God could pay that price. He died on the cross to pay the price for your sins. Scripture also tells us that he was raised from the dead. He's alive today so that we can have eternal life. What Jesus is describing in John 3, 16, he would pay the price for. He did pay the price. He gave his life so that he could offer eternal life. And the condition is this. Whoever believes, if you will believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he died for your sins, and if you will invite him into your life, you can have eternal life. Romans 10, 9 tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. You don't have to have all the answers. Nicodemus had most of the answers, by the way, from an intellectual standpoint. All you have to do is believe that Jesus is God, that he died for you, and that he's alive today, and invite him into your life, and you can be saved. That's the simple message of John 3, 16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever, that's a universal word, right? That's, a, that's an inclusive word. Perish, that's a sobering word. And in the end, here's the, the harsh reality. In the end, some will perish. Some, though, will live. What makes the difference is those who choose to believe. That's all you have to do is believe. Believe in Jesus and you can live. Jesus died for our sins so that we could be forgiven. A truth that boggles my mind. But as a seven-year-old boy, I realized that Jesus died for my sins. I invited him into my life. And I have experienced a life with him since. And look forward to an eternal life with him when I leave this world. And if a seven-year-old can come to that understanding, you can. Anyone can understand the truth that Jesus died for you. And you can put your faith and trust in him. He died for your sins and he was raised from the dead so that your sins could be paid for and so that you could have eternal life. And so the question today is plain and simple. Will you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Will you invite him into your life and accept him and the eternal life that he offers? John 3, 16, 25 words that changed the world. Guess what? Those 25 words can change your world too. If you will believe, will you believe in Jesus and receive the eternal life that he offers? In just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity for you to put your faith in Christ. I'm going to be standing down front along with our student pastor, Brother Caleb, one of our deacons, Dan. We're going to have some counselors that would love to talk with you about accepting Jesus, giving your life to Jesus. We're going to sing together. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to stand, and we're going to sing. And if you would like to believe in Jesus, if you would like to receive the eternal life that he offers, I'm going to ask you to do something. It's going to take just a little bit of courage, but I guarantee you it will be worth it. The minute we stand and start singing, I'm going to ask you to come down front and simply tell one of the three of us, that you would like to believe in Jesus, and we will have somebody talk with you. They'll take you to an area that's quiet, and they will talk to you about giving your heart to Jesus, believing in him. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We are amazed at the love, God, that you showed in sending your son, and Jesus, you coming down to this earth and living a sinless life and giving your life so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And all we have to do is believe. And I just have to believe today that there are people in this room, there's someone or many people who don't, who have not believed, who do not know you as Lord and Savior. And I pray that you would just give them the courage as we sing to step out from where they are and to come. And simply state, 
I want to believe in Jesus. Lord, give the courage that's needed and help, help all of us to have faith and trust in you. Or just lead us to make the decision you want. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you-